Welcome to IGN Live at E3. As always, Nintendo has a huge presence at E3, and this year is no different. From a jam-packed Nintendo Direct to tons of playable games on the show floor, Nintendo brought it all to E3 2019. Here to tell me more is Jonathan Dornbush, Casey DeFridis, and Tom Marks from Nintendo Voice Chat. Casey's the host. Hello. Watch that show. Listen to it. Um, big news this week. Obviously, the biggest one we got, Breath of the Wild 2, or Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. Uh, a or sequel is in a development. A sequel to, we don't know the name of it. Yeah, we don't no know official. anything. It's very um, confusing. Yeah. Big theory so far is that this could potentially be a co-op Zelda game. Sam Claiborne what? at IGN interviewed Anuma, and he oh. said, he was like, oh, are you guys working on co-op stuff? And he's like, huh, interesting. We will see. You know, and <laughs> oh, <that's very> <laughs> yeah. Um, instead of just being like, no. Uh, so this was obviously, I think, the biggest surprise of, of the show, if not one of the biggest surprises of E3 that didn't involve Keanu Reeves. <laughs> yeah. I think that's accurate, yeah. Or, or maybe if there isn't co-op, maybe we'll be able to play as Zelda. Because mm -hmm. uh, she's very prominent in this trailer. She's got a fancy, nice new haircut that's yep. short and ready for adventuring. But it's also <laughs> super unclear how this is even a sequel or where it's going to fall compared to Breath of the Wild. Because, like, it's be really grim, right? Like most of the world is dead yeah. at the timeline. And I know Zelda, like, don't want to get into spoilers for Breath of the Wild. I don't know what the statute limitations that. on that <laughs> is. But, like, it, it, it's unclear whether this is before, after, in the past, in the present. It's a prequel, a sequel. Like, it, they're calling it a direct sequel, but we really don't know how it actually fits into, like, a timeline sense of things. Okay. Not really. I mean, that's, like, the weirdest part about all this is that even when we do have an understanding of that, it's still the Zelda timeline. It's yeah. still... Which is still, like... Yeah. Eh, eh. Do you understand the Zelda timeline? Dude, it's, it's very timey-wimey. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've always described it as a plate of spaghetti. It's, it's just, like, it's all over the place. I don't, I don't think it... I don't think it matters. No. I, don't I, know, so. that, I know that Skyward Sword was first, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it matters. <laughs> is it? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. That because they're making the Master Sword. People are yelling yes. <laughs> yeah, <you're laughs> correct. Um, this got me thinking that we haven't really had Zelda playable um, in Zelda games, aside from the fact that she was um, in Phantom Hourglass, yeah. a ghost that could possess night. That was afraid of rats. That made me so mad. <laughs> and then obviously millions of casual gamers all over the world. Uh, consider the main character of Zelda to be main Zelda. Zelda. Yeah. And you'll be able to play as Zelda in Cadence of Hyrule, too, which That's is coming right. out this week. So we yeah. don't need to worry about Breath of the Wild. Yeah. That. No, it's no, no, fine. No. Yeah. I just uh, put a preview up of that game. I don't know why I said that very time. <laughs> I just put a preview up of that game. Um, so yeah, this is Breath of the Wild 2. I'm obviously super into it. I, I'm, my, my hope here is that it goes a little more dungeon-y. Yes. Yeah. It seems to be that way. I mean, the the entire it looks like they're in a dungeon in yeah. the trailer. It seems underground. And I'm some so glad that they gave us such a big, beefy trailer to really dive into. Yep. Like immediately after it finished playing, we all started rewatching it and playing it backwards. Play it backwards. It'll be it's an interesting time. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like a it's like a weird punk rock or like a rock album from <laughs> the 70s. No, it's weird. It's, <laughs> it's scary. Um, you can sync it up with Dark Side of the Moon. Something that's nothing like a rock album from the <laughs> 70s is Animal Crossing, which got a title and a delay, the good and the bad news of E3. Um, we got some more details about this in the Treehouse live stream. Uh, one of my favorite things about it is basically the ability to jump over rivers. I love um, that. Miranda Sanchez at IGN has been doing a tremendous job of breaking down news and details about this game. She's got tons of stuff on IGN right now, so go check that out. I actually didn't know, I figured we didn't know much about this game, and I started digging into what she was writing. and. Finding out that basically you start off in a tent and or there are only two other villagers in your town. Oh. And by using like sort of rudimentary crafting, you can beautify the island that you're on. And more and more people will be like, you want to go live there? It doesn't look as like, like, like a garbage hole like it <laughs> used to. Um, and then everyone in town has to give money to Tom Nook now, which makes me feel better. Yeah. You're all there for the same reason. Yeah. It's because of Tom Nook. So he could get a top floor in his, his apartment. Oh, you're building such a nice town in this beautiful area. I feel like he tricked people onto this island. I feel like this was a thing where he was like, come check out this island. It's, it's great. Island get getaway. Yeah, and there's nothing there. And he's like, okay, bye. You owe me $50,000. <laughs> like, but this is a really cool angle for Animal Crossing for me because it's basically taking the coolest thing they added to New Leaf, which was this ability to place a bridge or like build out a little fountain and customize your town a little bit. And they're saying, okay, 
that's the whole game is you start with a blank slate and you get to design it. You get to build the paths, you get to place all those things. And that's so cool. That's like, it's such a great, genuine evolution of what Animal Crossing is rather than just, uh, you know, another game. Yeah, my expectation was so much for it to just be, oh, I'm just moving to another new town and it's just gonna be simple like that. But yeah, yeah. This, this feels really new yet taking the core that has worked so well for so long, and, and I it, love it. And it looks like the co-op in this game is going to be a lot more robust than the mm -hmm. co-op in the previous Animal Crossings. Yeah, I think there's like a, a larger reliance on multiplayer this time around. Um, obviously, totally optional, but I, I really love that. I think that this is a game that gets better when you play with people, when you trade with people. Um, the communal element of all that is, is really wonderful to me. We'll uh, trade all the fl fruits. Yeah, it's just a bummer that we have to wait so long to play it. Yeah. yeah. But fine. yeah, this is great. You can you know you can do all sorts of fun stuff around your house and your town. Uh, we got some news about Smash Brothers. Uh, which is a couple yeah. things. very exciting. <laughs> I, so exciting. I assumed we would get at least one DLC character. They had to tell us. Actually, they said at the end of their tournament on, on Sunday that they would reveal Smash DLC. So we were expecting it. What I was not expecting were two. DLC character. Yeah. So they open the show with the Dragon Quest um, heroes uh, coming to Smash, including the most recent hero from Dragon Quest XI. And that was a really cool trailer. And But I have to admit, as soon as I saw it, I kind of groaned about getting another character with a sword. Because yeah. <laughs> do we really need more characters with swords? But later on in the trailer, they showed a really interesting mechanic. I have no idea how it works. But they brought up kind of a menu where you can choose abilities from the Dragon Quest series. Yeah. yeah. Which, I, again, I have no I idea how it'll work, but that looks awesome and I can't wait to play with it. It's, these, these characters and these you know, Echo Fighters and stuff, they, they brought a lot of their own charm that I think I'll flat out say that a, a lot of the Fire Emblem dudes are lacking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's just like sword fighter guys, and these guys come in, they're like, and we I, have slimes. I love, and I love the Fire Emblem guys. Yeah, I know you do. You know, I, that's why I felt bad making fun of them just now. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to jump over the, that was the couch the and stab me. <laughs> Um, uh, and I then obviously the the banjo kazooie thing, which yes. is like yeah. what such a wonderful surprise. Um, and I love the way they did that. How I they had duck hunt. That I video can't believe perfect. they did yeah. it, man. This is this is the I, we knew it when they were doing like K rule and when they did Ridley. This is the ultimate fan service game. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. This is them just checking every box on the like. Okay, what have people joked about in the past to be in Smash Bros? Well, and I love the the implications of it for the industry because we've been seeing this, you know, Nintendo and Microsoft partnership, whether it's in like Minecraft commercials or with Cuphead or Xbox Live. And this is just such a clear apparent like, hey, we can work together. We may be like console competitors, but we can still work together and bring things that the fans are craving and demanding. And it just, I'm so happy to have them back on the Nintendo console. Yes. They, I mean, this is like the, the dream wish list of every Smash Brothers fighter is finally there except for Waluigi. <laughs> <laughs> and Goku. They've Go and, yeah. Yeah. Waluigi Goku. Goku, yeah, that's Goku. And then it would be done. Yeah. No, that would that'd be Sakurai it. Can, can retire. Oh, if I mean, you bring us Waluigi and go. <laughs> Waluigi it, is in the game and he is where he should be, which is the garbage bin wow. of Aww. his trophy. How dare you? I will stand by that. How dare you? The garbage bin. <laughs> Waluigi is a top tier Mario uncle or cousin or something. <laughs> what? He's one of the most important, significant Mario extended family members or brothers. He's definitely the possible. tallest Waluigi <laughs> that there ever was. This <laughs> reveal. <laughs> <laughs> This reveal was so good to you because it started with the jiggy getting thrown through the window yeah. and immediately it was like, oh no, they're doing it. Yeah. It I great. gripped Joe Scrubbles' arm. When that <laughs> uh, well, we got to take a, br a very quick break. I almost had a, a Banjo-Kazooie break. Uh, but we will be back with more Nintendo Voice Chat right after this, so please stick around. Welcome back to Nintendo Voice Chat here on IGN Live at E3. Now, E3 isn't just about seeing games, it's also about playing them with our weird little hands. So let's talk about the games we played at the show, starting with Pokemon Sword and Shield. That was rude. Oh, man. So I was talking about my hands, by oh, the way. Okay. okay. Yours are great. No. Everyone has great hands with so me. So we got to play the water type gym uh, on the show floor at E3. Um, we got to see the new gym leader, Nessa, and see two new Pokemon. Um, one of them is a, an electric corgi, and the other one is this imp. And I don't know how I feel about 
The imp. I love the Yamper, though. Yeah, the Yamper, Yamper is, amazing. is adorable. I did not Dynamax him because Neither did I. he was going to get killed. So I Dynamax yeah. Grookey instead, and that was a wonderful I time. I did the same. Yeah. yeah. Well, huh. well the, <laughs> so the boss, the, the gym leader, has a Dreadnought, and that is Rock Water type. Yeah. So obviously, you got to use Grass against her. And I went into the stats, and I will be posting those on, on the wiki soon. So check out the Sword <laughs> and Shield wiki for the stats for all of these Pokemon that were in my team. Because I know. You guys are probably as interested in the stats as I am, right? Like, I, I love, thing there's about nothing Pokemon. I love more than Pokemon stats. We talk about it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really loved the look of the gym. And yeah. The it was like a classic gym. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But it was HD. Yes. Well, it's, yeah. so, it's so funny how much this shows how much Pokemon has and hasn't evolved at the same time, right? Because it is... Gorgeous looking. It's so a different scale. I really like the look. I really like the combat. I, I really like the new Pokemon and the look of them and the world and the design of all that. And then it's still like a really basic maze button puzzle, yeah. right? Like yeah. that's the gym. Is yeah. just you turn, you press buttons, and then the right order to turn off the colored yeah. waterfalls. And that's not a bad thing by any means. It's just so fundamentally what Pokemon gyms have always been. Yep. Kind of in this really new wrapper. Mm -hmm. Well, it was like even the last game, you would go into like a basement and there would just be like 60 conveyor belts, and you're like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. built this. Now, Casey, you do have a small beef with I the do. game, as they say. <laughs> I have one complaint. I know a lot of people share in the sentiment, but during the Treehouse segment, Masada said that you cannot transfer Pokemon that do not are not part of the Galar Pokedex. So what that means is that if you cannot already natively catch the Pokemon in Pokemon Sword and Shield, you will not be able to transfer old Pokemon into the game. Oh, really? And I don't think this is permanent. I'm sure this will come out in updates. Maybe they'll introduce more raids and then you'll and that's how they'll introduce more Pokemon because I mean more than 800 Pokemon being modeled in this high res game is probably a lot of work and really time consuming. So maybe they'll roll it out in the future, but at the start, it will not be transfer. Pokemon won't be transferable from Pokemon Home that are not in the regional Pokedex. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough one, right? Because yeah. it's like obviously you want all of your legacy content to come over, but you do have to understand that yeah, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I feel like Sakurai would have pulled it off. Yeah, no, probably. <laughs> Throwing it out there. That man wow. doesn't. Don't do that. Crunch Everyone is, is here. Sorry. <laughs> well, you had your Nintendo dreams come true. I did as well today. I got to play The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Uh, I played a 15-minute demo you where they basically were like, can you get to the end of the demo? And I was like, yes, I can. <laughs> and <laughs> everyone else was saying, no one's ever gotten to the end of this demo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, it was, I felt bad because the Nintendo rep was like, if you go to the beach, you can get the sword. And I was like, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is uh, you know, a, a game I have completely memorized. So that I, me speed running it is not indicative of how most normal people will play it. Um, but I found it really charming, and I found a lot of the little new details uh, really well done. There's a lot of quality of life stuff. If you're watching the video, um, Link just picked up one of those acorns, and instead of being prompted with this very old-school Game Boy dialogue screen, which was like two paragraphs, it just sort of snaps back in and snaps back out, and you're right back in there. Uh, obviously, with more buttons, you can uh, map things easier. You have sword and shield and jump automatically mapped to buttons already. But what I really like about this game is going into houses and exploring and walking into caves and seeing all the weird little details in the periphery. Um, even in the first house you wake up in the game, there's little like picture frames of the families on the wall and it's very, very Nintendo, just Nintendo charm everywhere. It, the art style of it is just so endearing and like from the first trailer I loved it and seeing this whole demo, I was actually playing with Pear. Mm -hmm. He was the one controlling it and it was funny seeing like what he did remember and also what he like, oh is it left? No, it's I have to go back down and around to figure out where to go. But everything, even when he did know so much of it, it was still such a delight to see the new character designs, the way little parts of the environment have changed and just like, yep. As Link in, we got into the dungeon as Link sort of goes through a part of the wall that turns around the door and seeing him kind of like plop into the door and then it just turns around. It's, so it's cute. adorable. Um, and so the second time I got to see the demo was Tom Marks right here playing it and me basically just standing over his shoulder and being like, dig right there, <laughs> open that door, go to there. Oh yeah, and then there's the Amiibo, the which I've, I've already pre-ordered two of. <laughs> Um, and there's a special edition that's uh, on Amazon that I got, and there's also a, UK, uh, like a, a, a European one that has a Game Boy Steelbook, but I digress. Um, I will find a way to get all these things. <laughs> but no, Tom did uh, some of the most sort of uh, esoteric and weird stuff in this game. I didn't even go in the forest. Yeah. I, just, I was about to go in the forest, and I was, uh, Brian was with me, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait. What else can we do? And so we like went fishing, yep. and we Aww. did the crane game, and, and then so we went even down like that little trading path. Yeah, and when you went fishing, we you notice a little glimmer in the seaweed at the bottom, and then you cast your line out there and caught a bottle. 
Yeah. And then a fish to, stole it. Tried to reel it Aww. in, and the yeah. fish grabbed it. It was Aww. great. The original game didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm already starting to see, like, oh, this is like a director's cut. This is a special edition. There's little details in there. We also initiated the trading sequence, which if you've played this game before, uh, is when you start grabbing items, and basically you get a Yoshi doll from a vending machine, you bring it to a kid who wants it, and the kid's mom is like, thank you, here's a bow. And you bring the bow to a character that wants one, and then they give you, a, like, a can of dog food. Yeah. And then you and bring it to that alligator dude. Mm -hmm. So we did we that. Could the, we could do the whole thing. <laughs> we, we went down that path. But my favorite part was Brian had just memorized the roots. So I got this Yoshi doll, and I was like, wait, where am I supposed to bring this? And he was like, two screens up, one screen to the left. There's a lady in a house <laughs> with a baby. You go into her. She gives you that. Then you take the bow down, two screens to the left. And I was like, dang, Brian. Like, I felt, what the heck? I felt bad. Um, we also played Luigi's Mansion 3, uh, starring Gooigi, Gooigi, a word I will never feel comfortable <laughs> saying on camera. Uh, what would you guys think of this? I felt bad for the ghosts. Tom, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, Luigi is savage in it, man. Yeah. yeah. He'll, he'll grab him, and when you do that, when you, like, get him all the way in, you just ram A, and he just, like, swings and hits him on the ground back and forth, and it's like... It's really savage. I wrote our preview for Luigi's Mansion 3, and my first, the thing that it felt the most like is when Hulk grabs Loki in the first <laughs> Yes. That and is just exactly. slams them around with pure joy and delight. But I like Luigi's Mansion has been one of my like favorite sort of like B tier, I guess, Nintendo series mm -hmm. that kind of has always been under the radar, but it's just so charming. There's not really games like it. And this definitely, to me, felt like it maintains the core of it while just adding onto it and onto it, even if that additive nature is Gooigi. Uh, yeah. who scares me in so mm -hmm. many ways, but mm -hmm. is actually pretty useful in actually playing the game. One of the I things we notice that's really disturbing is that when you use Gooigi, he, uh, Luigi himself like slumps over yep. as if his soul has left his body. Yeah. And we and asked Nintendo about that, and they did not really have a, a substantial comment. No, but <laughs> Janet, Janet Garcia did write a giant article all about everything you would ever need to know about Gooigi, mm -hmm. including what it's made out of. So you guys should look at that if you want to know He's more about He's a time Gooigi. traveler. That is a true Gooigi? fact. Gooigi? Yeah. Gooigi is a time what? traveler. Yes. No. He was sent back to the original events of the first Luigi's Mansion. He's made out of coffee. <laughs> what? Right? That's what Janet said. It's oh, a man. mixture of, like, coffee and... I don't know, some other this is a weird fever dream. Weird things. <laughs> there he is. Is, on, this, is this the year of Gooigi? I, I hope, hope so. not. I hope so. On the actual game, I was uh, I had a lot of fun with it and I'm very excited to play more of it. I was a little teeny tiny bit mixed on the format and the presentation. Yeah. Because each screen is basically like a little diorama sort of thing that you're seeing from a very kind of fixed sideways angle. Like you're almost looking into a playhouse. Mm -hmm. Uh and that's it's fun and they're really cool levels, but they're also I had more trouble and maybe this is just because it's a demo, but I had trouble kind of feeling the scale of everything. It didn't really feel like Luigi's Mansion One where you were exploring this big sprawling mansion. It just kind of felt like you were going from diorama box to diorama box. Yep. Uh. And that wasn't like a bad thing again, because I did have fun with the game. It just might make it feel a little bit more limited overall, a segmented. little bit, yeah, a little more segmented. But uh, of course, we don't know the overall structure beyond that. But well, I'm really Tom, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Tom beat the demo, did, and yes. he got an elevator button. Yeah. Right at the end. So oh. I, I was at a preview event for it, like right before E3 happened. And essentially, uh, the structure is you're at this hotel and. The elevator stops working because all the buses, uh, buttons go missing, and your job is to find those buttons to con successively go up each of the floors. And Which each is awesome. floor, I love that. And yeah. each floor is differently themed. Uh -huh. And they didn't really tell us what the themes were, but they were like, so you know, this is a more medieval theme, yeah. and then you'll go to another floor, and it may be a more like jungle -esque, esque themed oh, area. Oh, that's really cool. So I, and obviously, I don't think this is the entire floor. Mm -hmm. I would assume, like, I think they probably put you a little further into it. So I, yeah. I'm very curious to see what the scale of it all is. Me too. Um, I want to speed around through a couple other games we played. Uh, we played Marvel's Ultimate Alliance 3. We got to play that in co-op today. Yeah. Um, lots of really fun stuff there. I, it's, I think, my favorite a Avengers game of, of E3. <laughs> I, oh. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't play the other one. I don't think anyone really did. I saw gameplay of the other one. But uh, I did our preview for this one, too, and got to talk to uh, both Marvel Games and Team Ninja about this game. And I think... It's really, really going to be just like fan service the game for Marvel fans. Yep. And as someone who like loved X-Men Legends back in the day and the Ultimate Alliance games, mm -hmm. I think it really retains the core of it, but you get a sense of the developer side of things, whereas like Team Ninja, they're known for making hard games. Yeah. 
and they were talking to me a little bit. There are higher difficulty levels in this game you'll be able to attempt. There are these end game rifts that are much more difficult. Uh, and also when you're playing just one person on the screen, you can actually kind of go closer in into more of like a third person action combat. Oh, that's it, it's like a little bit more of a hero camera, they called it. And so they're doing a lot, I think, to you know, maintain what people love of the sort of dungeon crawler button mashy experience, but actually give it a lot more variety and complexity than I would have given it credit for. Because we played multiplayer today, and I think the easy, it was basically easiness was bumped up, or difficulty was dropped down. Uh, and it's it's totally fun, it's like very arcade -y, very kind of button mashy, but it was, it like, it scratched that itch for like just a fun laid back comic book game. We got to do some cool stuff, like a couple of us all pick spider theme characters at the same time, oh, okay. and mm -hmm. just unleash this like, Mountain of webs, <laughs> then it turned into a like a like shark? a plasma shark. <laughs> it's weird. It's great. Um, swinging around as Spider-Man was like really fun and cool. You can kind of just hold down B and track the course with the, your co-op players. Yeah, and with the team stuff, they have team bonuses come back as a big thing for getting mm -hmm. through the game. But you can also do like partial team bonuses if you just have two or three. We played Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, uh, the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. That's a very different game than all the other ones we talked about today. Casey whooped my ass all over that game. <laughs> <laughs> really did. He beat me in archery. I, I want to I point out a strange thing that happened in that game. Casey and I fought in karate, and I was Mario barefoot. She was Sonic with shoes, and I lost to her, but Tails, who was nowhere present <laughs> at all, came in third place. That's nonsense. In a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> The Olympics are rigged. Um, <laughs> that's all I have to say about Mario and Sonic at the Olympics. Uh, Casey, you did play Dauntless. Yes. So I've been playing Dauntless a lot, and I got to play it on the Switch today. And this is a game that I've been wanting to talk about on NBC for a long time because I really like it. Um, on the Switch, I'm not going to lie, it did run a little bit rough. But the Dauntless developers, Phoenix Labs, have been really candid and are constantly working on it to make it better. Like, for example, there was a particular fight that didn't run great on the PS4, and they've already released a patch to fix that. So it's kind of like Monster Hunter. So I guess you guys would be very surprised as to why I like I'm it. I'm floored that you're I know. Into this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, it is a little bit more accessible because you don't have as much inventory management, and if all of your teammates die, you can still keep fighting, and I had that. I've had that happen quite a few times where I'm one on one in a monster for the last ten minutes of the fight, but I can still do it. It's not a complete waste of time just because your teammates can't, you know, pull you through. And it's just a fun, cool game with different weapon types, and you can do really cool things with your armor, armor loadouts, and the skills that you can use. And the monsters, instead of being more animal-like to fit into a world, they're all built to be kind of more boss-like. I think is the best way to point out the difference between the monsters in Monster Hunter and Dauntless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this was like a this is a very popular game and it's one of those things that it's it, when you go over to the Nintendo's booth at E3, they have a massive section for Pokemon and Link's Awakening and Luigi's Mansion, they built like a Disney-esque haunted house. And then over on the side there's just like this huge hall of just third-party games just kind of hanging out on individual kiosks. And it's really cool to see. I'm excited to go over there tomorrow and just get my yeah. hands on a bunch yeah, of stuff. Yeah, Dauntless is free to play and just hit 10 million players. That's and then they got crazy. to be on the Nintendo Direct, so I'm very happy for that. Now you can play it anywhere you go. Yeah, you just can. Just slightly blurrier. Yeah, just okay. slightly blurrier. <laughs> um, Tom, you're one of the biggest Hollow Knight fans I've ever met. Uh, that is another tremendously popular game that found a huge audience on Switch. But there's more content. Is it is it a full-on sequel? Is oh it, yeah, it is right. Oh yeah. Did this start? <laughs> oh Brian. In? Oh Brian. Okay, oh, here we no. go. Let me tell you, <laughs> Hollow Knight Silk Song is a full sequel. It was a game that started out as a stretch goal for the original Hollow Knight's Kickstarter as a extra playable character within Hollow Knight. Uh, and they said, okay, actually, we can't do that because it would screw some, up some of the jumps, so we'll do like a little extra area for this character. And then they're like, actually, it's getting a little bigger, so we'll do an expansion for this character. And then finally, when they were going to announce the expansion, they were like, actually, we made it way too big, and it's a new game. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a completely new game. There are more enemies than in the, this game than there are the first one, and they're all new. None of them are the same enemy as the first game. That's crazy. And the craziest part about this is that E3 it is in that third party section that you were talking about. There are four little switches just with Hollow Knight Silk Song playable. Team Cherry didn't even tell anybody that it was playable there until today. So I literally, the first thing I did in the morning was run straight to that booth and play Silk Song. And I am so thrilled with it. I am so happy about it. I'm so happy with what it is. It's basically Hollow Knight 
but faster. It's Hollow Knight where you have, and this is an upgrade that you have to get, but you have a dash. And your heal, instead of being like this thing where you charge up and heal one, pe one point of health kind of slowly, is almost instant, and it heals three of your hits instead of one, but you have to use your entire, like, basically magic bar to use it. So the entire game is so much quicker, and it's more about, like, getting in those hits when you can, because if you're at one health, you can't just, like, run back and heal if you have a little magic. What you need to do is, like, be aggressive to get that healing and then pull back up. That's and awesome. It's it's just so, so cool, and I am so excited. I only got to play two levels, um, but I'm just absolutely so excited to play more of this game. And we do, we uh, got some footage today of you playing in handheld mode on Switch. So that's on IGN right now. You can go check it's it out. It's actually in, in uh, TV mode. Even better. Yeah. Um, that Do we have a release date for that? No, so they just said coming soon in the direct. We don't know. Wow. So in the meantime, you should check out Hollow Knight on Switch. I want to give a quick plug to the eShop, which is having like a massive sale right now. Uh, some really great indie games on there, including Blossom Tales, which is like the closest thing you can get to playing Link to the Past on Switch. But for now, that is all the time we have for NVC this week. But be sure to get new episodes of Nintendo Voice Chat every week on IGN, YouTube, and whatever you use to get your podcast. We literally talk about nothing but Nintendo every episode. Seriously, that's it. So you'll love it. There's plenty more coming up on our final day of IGN Live at E3, so don't go away.